So it's pouring rain in October in Montana. How much work did you put in on these this year? Oh, that would be a big zero. <laughs> so you just planted these a few years ago and they just keep coming back. They do. They're all ready. Yum. They taste a little like water chestnuts. Mmm, yum. Yeah, these are wonderful. They can be harvested as long as you can get into the soil all season. Mm. Even in Montana? Even in Montana, in the winter. Put carrots and potatoes and parsnips and sunchokes and put them all together in a big roast with a little bit of... Um, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of tamari, and um, and rosemary, and they're yummy. They grow anywhere from full sun to full shade, moist soils to almost full drought, never getting any water through the summer. They make big sunflower heads, so they look attractive, and they uh, provide good flowers for a lot of insects. And they're one of those roots where you dig up as many as you can find, and you're always going to miss some, and they're going to come back strong. I had thought I dug over this whole patch pretty well, and now we have eight foot tall sunflowers again. So. How many pounds of food do you suppose you got out of this little patch right here? Um, I, well, from the literature, one plant is supposed to be able to make up to like eight to ten pounds of roots in a season, but I'm not sure how like many square feet that is. I think easily we get a pound or more per square foot back here. And so this is probably a good 60 pounds. And actually, we could start harvesting as early as now. They're starting to form small tubers. Uh, it's obviously not going to be as efficient. Like, if we left it, we'd get a lot more yield than if we eat it now. But there's the flowers. So they look like sunflowers. Yeah. They're just getting started. I remember them being bigger blooms. Maybe these are just the very first ones. So they're just yeah, getting started. I think they're just getting started. I don't know. This seems about right to me. They're usually pretty small. We've watered this patch once this year. Uh, it's August 16th now, and we watered it maybe three weeks ago pretty well. And this year we've enhanced the Jerusalem artichoke patch by adding some ground cover plants and also mashua to bind up the Jerusalem artichokes. Last winter, from about 100 square feet of Jerusalem artichoke, I harvested about 100 pounds of the roots. And so I was eating almost a pound a day through the winter, which is really a lot. So I wanted to kind of balance that out a bit by adding in the mashua, get fewer Jerusalem artichokes, more mashua, more uh, pleasant balance of roots to eat through the winter. And then at the ground layer, we're trying some of the uh, Chinese artichoke, Statius affinis, I think they call it. The Jerusalem artichokes, the big challenge with them is that they store their starch in the form of inulin, which is, in, which is indigestible by humans. And so what happens is that you don't get calories from it, and a lot of it passes through you as gas, and so people just fart a lot after they eat them, hence the common vulgar name of fartichoke. <laughs> so what works well to convert inulin, and this is also an issue with camas, which was a major staple crop for natives of this area. Um, what people would do with camas and juice artichokes, and I think yucca roots, more in the, the western deserts, which also have inulin, is they would cook the roots for a really long time, usually in a steam pit or an earthen pit. So they build a fire and let it die down, and then put the roots in and add some water to get it moist and the close it up with earth and then let it cook for 24, maybe even 48 hours. And that long, slow cooking process converts the inulin to more digestible sugars so it tastes sweeter and you actually get calories from it and you don't fart, at least not nearly as much. So we weren't really enthusiastic about building giant pits and 
cooking for 24 hours at a time here. But we do have a wood stove that we, with which we heat our house all winter long. And so we usually are running a fire every morning and then maybe another one in the evening. So what I did all last winter was I dig up three or four pounds of Jerusalem artichokes at a time, put them in a pot, put them on the wood stove and let them just sit there for three or four days. And so they'd get cooked whenever the fire happened to be running anyway. And then at the end of that, I would take the roots out, eat them over the next three or four days, and put in my next batch of three or four pounds that I dug up. So there's another use when the Jerusalem artichoke plants have, uh, in the fall, and the leaves die down, you can use these stalks, which are really straight and pretty long for plant stakes. So when they dry? Yeah. Yeah, you dry them and um, you can use them for plant stakes, I've heard. But we use bamboo, so but I've just heard that you can do that. Okay. I sh should mention that our chickens actually eat a lot of juice and artichokes. Um, I would sometimes cook them up for them, like if I had little scraps of roots that were too difficult for me to clean adequately for me to want to eat them because dirt can get stuck in the little crevices. I would keep a little separate batch and cook them on the stove and then give them to the chickens and they'd eat them up. I also discovered at least by like mid or late winter, maybe this was after frosts had already sweetened the roots up a little bit, but when I would leave roots at the soil surface, the chickens would actually come over and eat them raw and eat a fair amount of it. Um, I think They'd I was, like pack little dents in them? Yep. And eat it all up eventually. And I think I was estimating that the chickens between the seven of them would probably eat about a pound of juice and artichokes a day. It's the size of the stem that'll tell you how much tubers you're gonna get. And these are big enough that I'm expecting to get a good crop of tubers off of these juice and artichokes. Great temporary heads. You can't see what they're doing over there. So if you won't, don't want people seeing what you're doing over there, you grow yourself a nice hedgerow juice and artichoke fastest growing a uh, single year hedgerow. Hi, this is Kelly and here is my little take on Jerusalem artichokes. So behind me here you see these great Jerusalem artichokes. This is a really great pile because it actually grew in sand and they're just huge. This is kind of the kid's sandbox and it got overgrown which is a great way to do uh, permanent kid fun little kid caves around here. I have these Jerusalem artichokes that came off of one plant and I'm digging them here in the fall because I just want to see what one plant will produce in the fall. If I were to wait until springtime, these would be much bigger, although this is a really huge plant and it's probably real happy that I dug it up because it didn't have a whole lot more room to grow, but they do get huge. And so I just take these off and I, I wash them up and I store them in the fridge or something, but these are like $3.85 a pound at the grocery store, the health food store. And you can get them from there and just stick them in the ground. So I usually, if I want a big plant to grow next year and I like the location, I'll just put one back in. Although I'm sure that it, when I cut, when I dug this up, there was, there were several that that didn't come up with the batch. But look at all this food. And you can have these raw. These are part of the raw diet. So, you know, this could be a good industry to supply for the raw people. It's high in whatever is really good for blood sugar balance for uh, diabetics. It's an excellent diabetic food. You can dry it and powder it and turn it into a type of flour, juice some artichoke flour if you want to get off the gluten or if you're gluten intolerant. So this plant, um, usually here in this zone, it blooms right before, and look at that, there's a little maple tree. You can plant that in the nursery. So this is, the, this is what's left, and I like to throw it on top of some bed that I need more good mulch on. And, and this is a really great carbon layer because it, it's, it, these are really great sticks in the fall. You can actually dry them and don't let them get wet, but dry them and then you can use them for canes for supporting other uh, crops in the spring, as long as they're not wet all winter. They'll, they'll rot pretty good. But anyway, so then I would throw mulch over that. Any chop and drop of, you know, like things that I'm going to clean up. I don't pull weeds anymore. I chop them. And anyway, so there's a lot of biomass 
that came out of a pile of sand that had these in here. And I've always had them in this area. They're kind of, once you put them there, they're like comfrey. They always will be in that area. This used to be a fence with a hedge. And so they just grow great in the sand. They're just awesome. Just awesome this year. I'll tell you about these Jerusalem artichokes. I have pickled them, fried them, boiled them, sauteed them, mashed them, put them in soups, and I still don't like them. Really? No, they're gross. Why do you grow them then? Well, because it's a survival food, man. Lewis and Clark depended on these a lot. Sacagawea yeah. uh, dug them up along the trail. Yeah. yeah, so you know, if ever we're starving, we're going to eat worms and Jerusalem artichokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to, have you ever roasted them? Um, what do you do? I do you slice, do I, I peel them a little bit, I roast, I slice them up, I roast them with a little bit of olive oil on them, then I pull them out and I put uh, lemon on them. Like oh, real artichokes, that does it's sound really good. better. Are you okay. I would suggest that. I'll try it. All right, this year. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about food security, homesteading, and permaculture all the time. Weapons. They're really? so pokey. Feel them. You could, yeah, <laughs> just irritate the animals. Yeah, <laughs> just irritate. Yeah, just annoy them slightly. <laughs> <laughs> My weapon is being slightly annoying.